Bruce Forsyth, have the Broadway butchers killed your prospects in America, as most of our newspapers have been claiming? Is that what they've done? Yes. <laughs> They're all, they never stop, do they? Well, no, no, it hasn't been complete butchery. I mean, I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know exactly what has been said. Um, but let me explain, Donald. In the Times and in the News, I did have two very bad ones. Now, the New York Post was uh, an absolute rave. It was uh, probably one of the best reviews I've ever had in my life. The other very important thing here is the Associated Press review. And that turned out to be a rave as well. So, actually, in point of fact, Donald, I've broken even. And um, I told the British press that were here in New York, actually, on the, um, on, on the opening night. They said, but how do you think it's going to go press-wise? I said, look, if I break even, I'll be satisfied. Even though you say you've broken even, there are, yeah. <clears throat> there are lots of people in the, among the American critics who don't think so. Well, why, what has personally made you been so desperate to break into America and go on Broadway? I'm not desperate. It's an ambition. You see, if you're a performer, if you haven't got ambition, then you might as well pack it in. One of the critics who wasn't so friendly said that your show was performed with the maximum of vigour but the minimum of innovation. Is it, is it possible that your, your material wasn't new enough? Not a possible at all. I mean, I've had things like that said about me in England. It's a part of our job to be criticised. The awful thing is that when you do break even, as I have here, you know only one side of the story is being given again. It's the same old nonsense. In fact, I'm going to do a TV show in England one day. I'm going to call it What the Papers Didn't Say. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's been anybody in the last... Not that I know. I don't think anybody has taken the, uh, the stick I, I've had over the last three years. Not as a, as a pro. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, and I think what, what it does to you when, you, when you get so much of it, I think you either say, I think it either, you either say, oh, well, oh, I can't stand it anymore, and you have a nervous breakdown. Or you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight this, and I'm, I'm going to have a go. And that's the way it affected me. By the end of the 1970s, Bruce and Anthea had separated. But this still didn't stop the press hounding them. Anthea's had more of a pasting than I have in the last couple of years. Anyway, she was in Miami and there's a big story going on. Then they found out I was in New York and a story went on that I was going to go to Miami to sort everything out. You know, we had been separated for a year and a half. The guy came to meet me and he said, there's about ten photographers, he said, they're all there. I said, oh dear. So now I know that they're now wanting from me a sad picture. See, Brucey comes back, you see, and then he's walking down the, yeah, thing, yeah, the yeah. corridor there, Plum. and they want a real sad picture. Yeah. So I thought, no, I'll, I'll just put on a great big grin, you see. So I just walked the corridor with this smile. Like this, right? <laughs> and I didn't rush like you normally do. If you're going to go, I don't do it like this. Then a, then a guy got here, a reporter here, another one there, you see. And they started firing questions. But I didn't answer them because, you see, if I answered a question and I went, straight away I've got a serious <laughs> face. <laughs> then they've got their eyes. So I kept them... <laughs> You see, and then they went on talking and talking and talking. I was going, <laughs> and, they went, and then it went on and on. I finally got to the door. I could go through, and then the reporter said, "Have you really lost your voice, Bruce?" I went. <laughs> <laughs> the now single Bruce was asked to judge the 1980 Miss World competition, but found his attention drawn towards fellow panelist and winner of the 1975 contest, Will Nalia Merced. She turned up with this red dress, with this mass of black hair and this... I thought, God, dear, oh, dear, God, <laughs> here I go again. <laughs> and I'd made up my mind I was never going to get married. The last thing I was going to do was get married. I was going to be, be Mr Frisky mm. for the rest of my life, but I saw her and I just fell like a ton of bricks. Just over two years later, Miss World 75 had become Mrs. Forsyth number three. People saw that I'm 53 and my wife was 23. <laughs> and... <laughs> People often say, they still say to me now, they say, you know, uh, how do you, you have such a well, young wife? Uh, what happened? How does it work? Uh, uh, well, you see, she keeps up with me very well. <laughs> <laughs> For all his successes with beautiful women, in the early days, people had come to different conclusions about Bruce. Sunday, 
sweet Sunday with nothing to do. Sunday. You were a hoofer. Hoofer, yes. A hoofer. Some people, I think, yeah. have thought you were a hoofer <laughs> over the years. Because if you don't mind me saying, Bruce, <laughs> you can air toward a, towards a mince. <laughs> Actually, when I first started at the Palladium, yes, uh, because of my walk, and I have got a, a bit of a funny, I know that. <laughs> For the first couple of years, people did think I, I was a homosexual. Who is it? Oh, Reds! Reds! And I think it was a way of getting to the women in the audience, to, to make friends with the women. If you said little remarks that women would say, I think it endeared you a bit to, to the women. And the men thought, you know, the great big whatever he was. But when my reputation caught up with me, they found out that wasn't true. Because you loved life, didn't you? I loved life and ladies. Yes. <laughs> Especially ladies. <laughs> While Bruce was enjoying his third marriage, he returned to familiar ground professionally, and through the 80s and 90s was at the helm of a string of game shows, including The Price is Right, You Bet, and Play Your Cards Right. All right, we asked 100 farmers, if the vet hurt his hand, would you be prepared to take a cow's temperature? <laughs> Where do you take a cow's temperature? <laughs> Well, come round the back and I'll tell you. <laughs> what makes a good contestant? A good contestant, well, somebody who is maybe a little bit nervous, but then when they get on there, they manage to relax. Oh, I love the shirt. <laughs> Lovely. Did you make it yourself? <laughs> Half of my job at the start there is to relax them. And uh, by having a bit of fun with them and chatting with them and talking about their lives... What do you do, uh, Barry? Uh, I'm self-employed, shop lift fitter. <laughs> shop <-lift> <laughs> <laughs> We'll start again, I'll take back. <laughs> All we need now are our plans. <laughs> we never knew what the contestants were going to be like, which was always fun for me to pick on something that yeah. they did that was funny. Like uh, camping. Do you find that camping makes your love more intense? <laughs> or... <laughs> or did you just go with him to bring him down a peg or two? <laughs> Did you feel like you were getting away from your comedy roots a bit at this time? Yes. I, 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 when I look back, I do realise, and I, I, I know this for a fact, I did too many game shows. Mm. But you see, you could do them so quick and the money was fantastic. Was money often a decider for you? Was it hard to turn it down? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, because it was so, so quick, you see, you could do a whole series of 16 shows in two weeks. Yeah, go like Three. For each new series, a catchphrase or two were never far away. Don't touch the pack, we'll be right back. I've had loads of them. I mean, I'm in charge, started it. I've had nice to see you, to see you. Nice! Did you do well? Good game, good game. All right, my love. What do points make? Right. It's another language, isn't it? <laughs> but, they just, <laughs> but they just happen with me, and I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can really make up a catchphrase. I think catchphrases just happen. Mm. You say something, and the public make up their mind whether they're going to make anything of it or not. Do you ever get tired of hearing them? <laughs> That's a good question, actually. You can get a bit fed up with it, especially when you're out somewhere. I went to the cup final, and if I heard good game once... <laughs> I heard it a thousand times. Bruce, I hope you enjoy... Good game, good game! 